success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. You'd be hard pressed to find a life, a career, or a body of work quite like that of our guest today, singer, songwriter, performer, and composer, Jack Williams. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I got to say, reading your bio, it, it, first of all, it's like a small novel. You have accomplished quite a bit in your life, not only as what we just talked about, a singer, songwriter, and a performer, but also in the... Uh, in the cuisine world, you're you're quite the the chef, from what I understand, and you've accomplished a lot. Let's let's get back to the very beginning. How did you get started in all this? You were a marine. Mm -hmm. Were you musically talented leading up to that? Mm -hmm. Yes, I was. Yeah. yeah, I started playing in bands when I was a kid. Started playing in. I had a band. Hmm, gonna say eighth grade when the Beatles came out, probably right around the six early sixties. We had a backyard band and we played Beatles songs and. Uh, I sing a little bit. I sing All My Lovin' and um, Twist and Shout. Then Tommy, my buddy Tommy, we had a Beatles band, and we also played Rolling Stones, um, um, Paint It Black, and, and um, It's All Over Now. That was one song I sang. We had this little backyard band, and then that grew into a band where I played at the prom, you know, and, and stuff. My dad got me a Hammond C3 organ. Oh, wow. Because he didn't want me. He bought me the, I don't know if you remember the... Um, the silver tone guitars that you bought and they had a, a case and yep. you lifted them up and then you the amp stood like that and you plugged it in and plugged the guitar into the amp they were classic they were, and he bought me that and i started playing rock i wanted to play rock and roll and he said no you either play country music or i'll take it away from you and i went i don't want to play country music i want to play rock and roll and he said well then i want to take it away from you and he did he did. He did. And um, he gave me one more shot. He said, I'll buy you one more guitar and I'll teach you Wildwood Flower. If you play Wildwood Flower, I'll let you keep it. So I learned to play Wildwood Flower. And I thought that was pretty cool, but I still wanted to play rock and roll. And I wanted, then the van Vanilla Fudge came out with, dee -dee 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 -dee. that's when I wanted an organ. And it was like, I want to play that. Wow. So that's how I got started playing music. And then you went into the Marines. Yeah, and then I went into the Marines, and um, and I just wanted to be a warrior, you know. I mean, I had um, a weird, weird childhood, and, 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 the, and it just seemed like the only way I could impress my father was to go in the Marines and do something drastic. So I joined Force Recon and went to jump school and went to all that. And just about the time I was supposed to go to Vietnam, some weird thing happened which god it was a god moment i guess because i would have never come back right the force recon at that time in vietnam at that time um the ratio was one out of four came back and that person came back without something so i mean it was a death wish i knew it but something god stepped in or something uh it was, it was the day before christmas and i was supposed to go home for you know you always go home before you go to vietnam and my commanding officer called me into the office and he said, we got a little snafu here from Washington. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, there's two sets of orders here. He said, so I'm going to go outside and smoke a cigarette. And when I come back in, whatever order is there is where you're going. And, you know, something made me decide that I didn't want to go die. And the orders, one order was uh, Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii, to work in Hawaii. And the other one was to... Hanoi yeah. and I ripped up to Vietnam and threw it away and went to Hawaii and started playing music in Hawaii with a bunch of people wow that's yeah. an amazing story yeah. it was God I think yeah I mean because up to that point I really I trained man I trained all I did all the force recon stuff that I jumped out of airplanes and we had intensive intensive black op trainings and all that shit. Sorry, all that stuff and um That's okay, it's a podcast. We can say that stuff. Uh, anyway, um but yeah, but when the moment of truth came, I wanted to live, you know, and I'm glad I made that decision because my outfit didn't come back. Wow. Oh my gosh. Cuz we had to my what I would have been doing with 
got there and what we would have been doing, we would have been haloing um, 30 miles on the other side of the DMZ and four of us would have walked all the way back and, and, and recorded everything that we saw all the way back and crossed back over to the DMZ I'm trying to avoid any firefight we could, but obviously if there was one, we would have had to get into one. And nine out of ten times, it never, they never could get all the way back. Right. Oh so my gosh. That's what happened. But I played music in the service, and I wrote songs, and um, and then when I came out, um, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to, I wanted to play music. I wasn't sure about the songwriting yet, but I knew I wanted to play. Were you? When you say you hadn't really thought about the songwriting yet, is is that something that just came naturally to you? You were, you would get an idea and you could go, I, I know how to transcribe this and mm -mm. turn it into something. Mm -mm. How did that part come about? That part came about in twofold. Um, I was living in Atlanta at the time, and um, Alex Cooley. At, at the time, owned Atlanta. He was the promoter. He owned Alex Cooley's ballroom. He owned everything. Do you remember Alex Cooley? And he liked me. He liked me, took a liking to me. He liked my motivation. He liked that I tried and tried. But at that point, all I did was write. I could play guitar, but everything I did was on paper. So I would write it. And he, um, he gave me carte blanche. He gave me a backstage pass. He said, I know that you know what to do back there and what not to do. I trust you. So you, know, you can go to any of my shows if that'll help you get somewhere. And so Genesis was there, and they were playing Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, if I remember right. And I wanted to meet Peter Gabriel. <clears throat> and I stood back, and I stood back, and I waited, and I waited, and waited, and I was scared. Never been backstage before. And, you know, and everybody was somebody, and they were trying to be somebody. And, and suddenly there he was, and he was just smoking a cigarette. And I just walked up to him, and I said, um, would you mind looking at a song of mine? And he went, sure, mate, of course. And I reached in my pocket and pulled it out. And he read it. And he said, well, this is really good. He said, but this isn't a song. This is a poem. Uh -huh. I went, oh, he said, a song is words and music. You do understand that, right? And I went, ah. Oh. He said, you play guitar or piano? And I said, yeah, I play guitar. He said, well, go home, play your guitar, put this to some kind of music. Find somebody you like, listen to how they do it. And, you know, first chorus, da, 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 he said, and and uh, I said, oh, well, thank you. And as I walked away, he said, one more thing. And I said, what's that? He said, the most thing that you'll have to remember the most in your whole life is perseverance and persistence or you won't get there. And I've never forgotten that. And I am still that guy. Yeah, I am still persistent. Just ask Kevin Costner. <laughs> he told my <laughs> wife last night on the phone it was her 50th birthday, and I got him to call her for her 50th birthday, and he said, one thing Jack is is persistent, <laughs> and I love that about him. And we're, we're going to talk about your relationship with Kevin Costner here in a little bit, but let's, let's kind of— The twofold on that was, yeah. so then I got good. At, no, I am the wrong thing. I got to where I could put a song together. Once I could put a song together, then I went back to Alex— and he said, well, you need to do a little demo. I said, what's a demo? And he said, well, we'll go in the studio and put it down. And he said, I know the right guys. And um, What's that song in the afternoon? Um, the Lana band did. Um, wasn't the Amazing Riz and Maces, but it was something in the afternoon. Anyway, that band was session musicians, and he put them all together, and they went in, and they sang, and they did three songs. And, you know, they, I mean, looking back now, they probably were terrible, but they, they, were, they did them and they made them sound great. And then I was a chef. I was the sous chef at the Abbey. You know the Abbey restaurant? Ever been there? It's still there in Atlanta. And I had a wife. Fast forward, I had a wife and a nine-month-old baby girl. And we were living in Stone Mountain Apartments. And I had whites chef's hat well it, I, didn't, I was in a car I didn't have my chef's hat on but i had the white chef jack striped pants uh, and i was on my way to the abbey and i went by the stouffer's hotel at that time and there was all these guys standing outside with blue jackets on and i slowed down and looked and it said the who 
oh, man. And I pulled over and walked up to the first guy I saw, and I said, what's the chances of meeting Roger Daltrey? And he said, slim to none, mate. And I went, okay. And I knew I had to get to work, so I just turned around and walked. He said, but wait a minute. He said, well, what do you want to meet Roger Daltrey about? And I said, I'm a songwriter, and I wanted to play him, see if he'd listen to my song. Well, hang on. He got on the house phone, he called up Roger, he said, I got a little songwriter out here who wants to meet you. Okay, all right, okay, cool. He said, I, he's busy right now, he said, get you a room. <laughs> he said, get you a room, and, and when he has time, he'll talk to you, and I'm going, I gotta go to work. But screw work, and I went to who, you know? So he got me a room, Doug, Doug Clark, still my best friend to this day, he lives in England, he's still Roger's right-hand man, and, um, we got a room, and I had my whites on, right? Yeah. I said, I can't go to the show in this. I got to go home. How far do you live? I said, well, Stone Mountain's pretty, a good little jaunt from here. I said, it'll probably take me two hours to go down, change clothes, come back, try to grab my wife. Let's take the limo. So we took the limo and pulls up. I live on the second floor up there. My wife comes out holding the baby and she looks down at the limo and she said, why ain't you at work? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'm with a who? I don't care. Get your ass to work. I said, no, 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 no. We're going to go see the who. We got backstage and she went, you're going to go see the who. <laughs> I'm not going to go see the who. And you better not lose that job. And well, to make a long story short, rock, they had a three night. That was a three-night stand at the Omni, I believe it was. I can't remember. I think that's what it was. And Roger couldn't see me that night, and I didn't see the show that night. I just stayed with Doug backstage. Couldn't see me the next night. I got fired the next night. Couldn't see me the next night. Now we got to go to Chicago. And they took me to Chicago with them. And I went to the Playboy Mansion with them. And I see... At Hugh Hammer. So, I mean, here I am, 21 years old. And um, on the road, well, I mean, I was part of the team, you know. Now I was part of the part of the little tight-knit team, but I still hadn't met Roger or Pete. Yeah. I met Bill Kerbisley, their manager, and Jackie Kerbisley, who are famous to this day. And still, Jackie's dead, but Bill's still alive, and he still manages them. And five months later, I ended up in Boston. We went to Philly. I went on complete tour everywhere. Roger never had time for me. Just never had time. And never saw a show either. Never saw a show. And then suddenly, Bill Kerbersley walked up to me one day and backstage, and he said, Roger, ready to see you. It was the last night of the tour. And he said, Roger's ready to see you. Him and Peter are upstairs. And I said, okay. And I went upstairs and I got my guitar and I went upstairs and I walked in and Roger was sitting there with like six of the prettiest women that you've ever seen in your life. Women that just make you just go, oh my God. You know, and, and if you haven't been used to seeing women like that. Hey, hey, mate. I know, I know, I know it's been a while, but play a song. And I was like, <laughs> sign him up. <laughs> Bill said we got the paperwork right here, and they had a, it was all pre-planned. They had a year's contract, my first publishing deal, and the way it was going to work was I was going to get $100 a week, and they would send it to their American banks, and I would write songs, and once a month, um, uh, Pete would get on the phone with me. He, after he listened to songs, Pete would get on the phone with me, and he would talk to me about construction or anything like that and it was basically going to build and that's where i really learned how to write songs that's where he would go well, what is this shit in his first verse of this song pete townsend mm -hmm. i've got a letter in my house from him about that and and um and that's how i learned from the from peter gabriel to pete townsend that's how i got my structure of how to put a song together Wow. To answer your question. We're going to take a break, get a word in for one of our sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to have some more of this very interesting conversation with Jack Williams. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, 
the Singer Songwriter Rulebook. 101 ways to help you improve your chances of success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics, all written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. Thanks. Back in the studio, Jack Williams is here talking about really in. One of my favorite times of the music mm. generation was the 70s. I think the music was the best it's ever been, and we've talked about that on other shows. You have a Richie Havens story mm. that I, I've got to hear. Yeah. You were you were persistent on that one, too. Oh, you, yeah, that's what got everything really started. That's what, that was, that was, that was, um, that was right during that little period I was still living in Atlanta the who had I had done with the who thing and and Richie came to town and I was a big fan of Richie's and and I as he walked through the if I remember right as he walked through the backstage area I asked him if there was any chance that we could get together I introduced myself of course and asked him if there was any chance that we could get together at the, after the show and 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 talk music and he went of course i'm staying at the so-and-so i mean seriously he went i'm staying at the so-so room so-and-so just come by you know give me an hour or so to get back and i'm by myself well i got my girlfriend with me but yeah man yeah come on so i did and I watched him go in his room with Michelle. And Michelle was his girlfriend. I ended up being really close friends with Michelle. And and um, I waited about 40 minutes. And I knocked on his door. And there was no answer. This is like 11 o'clock at night. And I waited a half an hour more. And I knocked on him. No answer. And midnight, I knocked on the door. No answer. But I could hear him in there. You know, I could hear him. I could smell him. <laughs> I knew that they were in there. I could hear music. I could hear him playing his guitar, and I could hear him talking. So I knew that they hadn't gone to bed yet. So at 1 o'clock in the morning, man, about 2.30 in the morning, he opened up the door, and he went, you sure are persistent. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, we saw you out there. I was wondering how long you were going to stay here. Long enough for me to open the door. Come on in. And that was the beginning of that. I ended up. He ended up that to make a long story short, he he saw something in me that he liked and um he said, Here's what here's my address, here's my phone number, here's my office, here's everything and you need to know. I'll tell Marcia in New York about you. Anytime you need to come to New York, just come to New York, bring your songs and I'll help you do something. Okay. And that led to like a month later taking everything I own, taking the rent money, taking the everything but enough for the groceries for Robin and the baby and taking everything and jumping on a bus and going up New York with that demo tape. And Richie, um, Richie put me up in his houseboat on a 79th Street boat basin. And I was going to meet him up at his office the next morning at 10. He came in at 10. He said, let me... Uh, let me give you a list. And he, Ahmet Erdogan, still on Clive Davis, did a da 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 da. Call all these guys. Their caller at this time, you could actually call their receptionist and get an appointment. You know, using his name, of course. Richie Haven suggested that I call you, and I got an appointment with all of them. And they all threw me out. Clive Davis was the worst. Clive Davis listened to my song and he went, what the shit is this? And he <laughs> said, let me, and he reached around and he pulled out Barry Manilow's newest demo. And he put it in the thing and he went, this is a, this is a song. 
this is a hit song. And I mean, like, and I went back, I was crying. I was like, I lost all our money. I spent everything I didn't. Richie said, calm down, calm down, calm down. He said, tonight we'll go down to my studio in Soho and we'll fix this problem. And we went down to his studio that night and he did a guitar vocal of one of the songs. Um, Dino played some congas on it and they just did a little, just a little guitar vocal with some congas and Richie playing guitar and maybe, maybe a little bit of, another bit, of, uh, I think his brother played a little guitar on it too. And um, he said, now tomorrow, he said, go, let's go back to the office and call them all back up and tell them that you and I went in the studio last night and you want to play them something fresh. Just say that. So I went back in. First person I went back in was Clive Davis. And I said, I want to play this. Richie sang this last night. Richie sang it? Uh-huh. Yeah, he thought, he, he thought maybe that might make it a fresher. He didn't listen to it halfway. So he said, I'll do a single song deal on this and give you $1,000 advance. Is that good enough? And I went, wow. Went back to Richie and said, Richie said, what did we learn from this? I said, I guess it's who you know. And he said, exactly. Yeah. And he said, and remember that. And then I went back up there later on and I spent, I spent quite a lot of time up there. He, we put a band together. He wanted me to sing in front of this band. If I had listened to him, maybe all the stuff that's happening now would have happened a lot earlier. But we put a band together, played the bottom line. And then I did a tour with him in England, opening up for him. And um, it was just kind of like what I'm doing now, basically. Only, uh, only a real small band. Uh, it was me on guitar. I had a sax player and a, a guitar player. And uh, it was really ec eclectic. But... Um, um, a lot of people came to those shows. I mean, Dave Mason came to one of the shows and he was in this old ratty shirt and everything. And, and he came up to me and he went, man, this is cool stuff. Richie was standing next to me and he said, this is really cool stuff. And I was like really cocky back then. I was like, yeah, cool. Thanks, man. And he walked away and Richie said, how rude. He said, do you know who that was? And I went, no. He said, that was Dave Mason. He said, you should have shown him a little bit more respect. He said, don't be like this. And he taught me how to be a person with people. And so I got that from him, you know. From that on point on, I was never cocky ever again with anybody because it embarrassed me, you know. And then he did it in front of everybody. And, and so I got, that's where I learned how to be, you know. A good person in front of people, I guess, is the word you want to know, you know? That's my Richie Haven story. A little forward to Uriah Heep. How did that all come together? Was that was that after Richie? During. During? Mm-hmm. Um, end of the year's contract with The Who, Uriah Heep was on an American tour. And that, my two favorite songwriters ever, Don Henley and Ken Hensley. Two sides of the board, I know, but Ken Hensley wrote the greatest stuff for Uriah Heep, Demons and Wizards and July Morning and Look at Yourself. Some of the greatest rock stuff, are really melodic, really well-written lyrics, well-written songs, and I wanted to meet him. Same thing um, happened. I, I, I focused on it, and, and I met him backstage at the uh, show, and he said... <laughs> He said, um, you know where we're staying? And I said, yeah, and because Alex helped me out with all that. He said, well, meet me in the bar after the show. He said, we're all going to be in the bar. He said, we'll be in the bar an hour after the show. Meet me there, and we'll talk. And sure enough, they did, and we hit it off. We really did. We had a lot of fun talking, and I gave him my cassette tape. I gave him that demo thing, and, um, and he, he said, I'll call you. I'll call you. I really will. I'll call you and let you know what I think. Never heard from him for about six months. And about six months later, the phone rang one day and I answered the phone and he said, Jack. And I said, yeah. And he said, Ken Hensley. I went, hey. He said, uh, how'd you like to move to England? And I went, really? He said, yeah. He said, we want you to work in our publishing company. And he says, and you'll probably end up getting a song or two on Uriah Heap's record, which no one's ever done outside the band. 
they had always done everything internally, right? Uh huh. And he says, I got you a little apartment near me. I live in Henley on Thames, across the street from George Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't believe that this all, you know, but and he said, Alvin Lee is my neighbor and you'll get to hang out with all of them. He said, I got your apartment. I got you a car. And he said, I'll give you a, a hundred quid a week. No, I think it was about 70 quid a week, which comes to about 125 a week. And he said, one, one thing though, Jack. And I said, what's that? He said, I can't bring your family. Uh. So this is going to have to be a long distance relationship to see how this works out. Maybe down the road. But right now, it's just you. And Robin and I weren't getting along at that point anyway. We had, things were really bad. We're, things went bad from the Who thing. Went bad anyway. And, you know, I just went, Ken Hensley, fame and fortune, rotten family life in Atlanta. <laughs> no, cho no choice. I'm going to England. So I did. And I got over there. And that was a um, successful part of my career, number one. It was... I. That's where many, many great things happened. That's where Ronnie Van Zant and I became great, great friends, and Gary and Rosie and Skinner and I, we regrouped over there. That's where um, I met Jimmy Page. That's where I met, um, that's where I have got a demo with um, Ken Hensley, um, Simon Kirk, Mick Ralphs, Alvin Lee, and George Harrison on it of a song that they just happened to be in the studio that night when we did a demo of my oh song. Oh my gosh. I mean, I, met, I just hung out with those guys and th those years were the great years. And talk about being around that music back then. I mean, Uriah Heep, there was a, there was a um, down, in, down in the middle of London, there was a rehearsal hall that all the big rock bands used. And it was three floors. And at this point, Uriah Heat was getting ready for, for the next American tour, and they had the bottom floor. Jethro Tull had the middle floor, and Led Zeppelin had the top floor. And I had carte blanche, because I was a songwriter with Uriah Heat. They, they were recording one of my songs. And, and so I got, to, I got to know the roadies of the other bands, and I got to know everything, you know, and I got to hang around and, and watch... And I tell the guys, I was telling Tom Bukovac the other day, we were talking about the difference between bands these days and the bands of those days. You're right. Those bands re rehearsed eight hours a day, eight weeks before they went in the studio and before they went on the road. These were today's bands. I, they don't do that kind of stuff. But it was amazing. Like with Led Zeppelin, they would all be there except for Paige. And they'd be, and there'd be a big urn, a tea urn, because everybody in England drinks tea, you know. And everybody bawling around, drinking it, everything hooked up, everything done. And then a limo would pull up. Jimmy Page would get out with his guitar. He'd walk in. He'd say hi to everybody, just really friendly. He'd go upstairs. He'd walk down, open up his guitar, strap it on, walk up there, and go one, two, three, four, and they'd do their show. They'd do a two-hour show, nonstop just with all the ad-libs with everything you could think of and then they would do the two encores and they'd say see you tomorrow boys and get back in the car and leave it was just something to see for at my age you know it was i an, think at anybody's age it was yeah. an education yeah just to watch how people did all that stuff and that's where i got my work ethic i got my work ethic from being around those guys because it was real and it was hard work and songwriters um, Jackson Brown and 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 Ronnie Van Zant and Ken Hensley, they, they were true songwriters. I mean, they sat down and they crafted their song, and it was good. it was real, real heart heart songwriting. And that's when I came back over here after I left there. And that was that got you into the southern rock scene, right? Sort of, sort of. No, not really. I mean, yeah. I. I Ronnie and I became the best. Skinner and I, we we're all from Florida, so we became really close friends. And and Ronnie and I were going to do some stuff, and then you know, then the plane crashed, and um, and everybody went their separate ways. But I uh, I hooked back up with Greg and Dicky in Florida, and put a band together in Florida, and Dicky produced it. And then when that was all said and done, I didn't know what to do because I had come back here. I, my time in England was done. My visa 
There was no sense of staying there anymore. Uriah Heap was about to break up. Their stuff, I had songs on their records. Everything was done. I was in the middle of a doors here. I was playing music, but I didn't know what to do. I was a songwriter now, a real full-fledged pro songwriter. But I didn't know what to do. I didn't know, do I go to New York and hang out with Richie? Do I go to L.A.? And I didn't even think about Nashville. Nashville wasn't even in my... And Dickie Betts said, you're a songwriter. You need to live where songwriters live. He said, and I'll help you. He said, come on up to, come with me to Nashville. I got a little house in Green Hills. You can stay in the basement. My manager is Joe Sullivan of Sound 70. He managed Charlie Daniels too. And had, so you remember Joe? And he says, and Joe can make some calls for you. And he did. He called Noel Fox, called all Tim Whipperman, called them all. I had meetings with them all. And Noel signed me a silver line, goal line. And that was the beginning of my thing. And that was 19, about 84. We're going to take another break, get another word in for one of our sponsors. We come back, we're going to find out what Jack Williams is up to these days. He's got a new project coming out and uh, his work with Kevin Costner. Hi, this is Tom Sabella, the creator, founder, and co-producer of the Business Side of Music podcast. It's loyal listeners such as yourself that make our podcast successful. Take the time to sign up for our weekly newsletter. Not only does it contain information on upcoming podcast episodes, but also informative tidbits on the music industry and even bonus items that we give away. All you have to do is sign up at businesssideofmusic.com and we will send you Larry Butler's new singer-songwriter rulebook. That's it. All you have to do is go to businesssideofmusic.com, sign up, and we will send you Larry Butler's new book. Thanks to all our loyal listeners. We love you. Back in the studio, Jack Williams is sitting across the microphone from us. You let's we're going to fast forward now. And what you said uh, during the break, you and Kevin Costner got together, what, about seven years ago or so? Yeah. And how did that come about? And you've been doing some work with Kevin because of that. Oh, yeah. We've gotten to be really good friends. I mean, the best of friends that that started another me doing me. I said to my wife, I want to work with Kevin Costner. Okay. And I started after it. And, you know, red flags, red flags, red flags, red flags, red flags. And then suddenly, digging, investigation, digging, and suddenly I found this little thing in the, somewhere in the whole thing was Kevin Costner and Modern West. Hmm. He's got a band. Okay, now let's dig a little further. And two of his band members live in Nashville. And one has a studio right next to Blackbird in the creative in the creative in, in creative workshop in Buzz Kason studio up. And he's got an email address. Ah oh, man. <laughs> you know, I was like, I wrote Teddy and I went, Teddy, my name is Jack. And whenever I do stuff like this, I always go, here's my bio, so that you know that I'm for real and that, you know, I'm not just somebody off the street. Let's have a cup of coffee and talk. Sure. Let's do it. So we did. Teddy said, what do you really want? And I said, I want to work with Kevin. And he said, okay, I like your honesty. He said, but the, it, Kevin's very organic. Everything has to come out of, out of, out of the circle. So you, you got to write with me or Park or somebody. And, and, and it's all gradual. So I said, okay, let's write. So the first song we wrote is a song called Heaven So Far Away. And um, he, everything that Teddy does, everything I do now, he sends to Kevin. Kevin fell in love with that song. He wanted to record it. Kevin, Teddy went out, flew out. They recorded it. It ended up being in the, part of their show. And Teddy and I kept writing. And every time, there, about every third or fourth song, Kevin wanted it. And then fast forward mm, two years, maybe, of doing this. Um, Kevin was going to do a little 
five stop tour, start two dates in Fort Myers, and then this big rock club in in Knoxville. It's it's a chain, and I can't. It's not Coyote. It's a it's this big rock club that's there's one in Tech, one in Houston, one in Knoxville. It's huge. And um, Teddy said, "Why don't you ride? I'm gonna drive up there. So why don't you ride with me?" And he said, "You can help me drive back." And he said, "We can keep each other company." He said, "Show ain't till 11. Sound checks at three, and then I'm going to sleep. Everybody's going to sleep, so you're on your own. Can you do that?" And I said, "Yeah, I can do that. I don't care." So every day, I watched the sound check. Um, didn't meet Kevin. He just walked in and did his sound check, and everybody went to bed. And I was out in the parking lot on my phone talking to Kathy, my wife. Somebody came up and tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around, big tall guy, and he said, Hey, I'm man, I'm Tim. Um, are you Jack? And I said, Yeah. He said, Kevin wants to talk to you on the bus. And I opened the door and <laughs> he was there and um t shirt, jeans, barefooted, working on a script, and he put the script down and got up and he said, One question. And I went, What's that? He said, How'd you like how I sang your song? And I looked at him and I said, you could sing shit and I would have loved it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what I said to him. And I said, no, man, I love what you did. It was great. And he shook hands and he said, sit down. And, and we just started talking and one thing led to another. And we finally got to this point where he said, what do you think of the band? I said, oh, man, his band is really good. They really are. They're kick ass. And I said, the band is great. The songs are great. You're great. But he must have heard something in my throat. And he said, but. And I said, no buts. He said, yeah, I hear a but. And Mark Gillard, his right-hand guy, that is an editor. <clears throat> you hear a but, Mark? Mark said, yeah, I hear a but. <laughs> I said, all right, all right. I said, two of those songs, I said, you need to rekey. And he went, what do you mean by rekey? I said, they're too high for your voice. You just need to bring the song, the key of the song. Like if they're in A, you need to bring them down to G, so you don't, you're not straining your voice because you're you sing low and raspy. And I said you're up there at the top of your voice and you're cracking. That's what I've been trying to tell a goddamn man for the last two years. <laughs> and so they, well, the band walks on, right? I've never met the band at all. Band walks on. Teddy's not with him at this point. It's everybody. And I hadn't met him. And they walked on. And, and he goes, Jack says we need to rekey these two songs. And they look like, <laughs> looked at me like, who are you to even? But Teddy walked on and he went, I've been telling you guys that same thing. Jack's right. They rekeyed it on the spot. And from that point on, a month later, I was at his house in Santa Barbara, and we were talking music, and he said to me, I have a dream that's never been fulfilled. I said, you have a dream that's never been fulfilled? And he said, yeah, I do. He said, the band, he said, they've been with me for 15 years. He said, we've done a lot of great things. He said, but one thing we've never done. He said, I've never been able to have a song. I never heard my voice on the radio. He said, you think you could help me do that? And I said, yeah, without even giving it a second thought. <laughs> Not uh, about a clue. I mean, I've been in the business long enough that I could figure out, you know, figure it out. I said, of course I could. I said, but not with any of these songs. And honestly, I said, there's not a radio song in the bunch. And I said, so you'd have a hard time with that, even with your name. Well, write it. I said, well, Teddy and I will write it. So we did. We wrote a song called Love. And then they, then he said the parameters. He said, okay, here's the parameters. I can't do a radio tour because I make movies. And he said, I'm getting ready to go make one pretty soon. And he said, I can't. I said, so I can't do that. He said, money? I'll spend some money, but we got to talk about it each time. Make sure it's, it's, it, it's the right thing to do. I said, okay. He said, but now phone calls. He said, I'll make any phone call you want. I'll talk to anybody you want me to talk to as long as we do it on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. And we do it between nine o'clock in the morning and 11 o'clock in the morning, my time. And it's pre recorded. Nothing live. I don't like live interviews because things can go wrong. And 
I, I want it to be edited. Can you do that? And I went, yeah. I went home. I called a buddy of mine up in Detroit who I knew knew radio really well. And I said, want to help me get a Kevin Costner song on, on the radio? And he went, yeah. And so I went and got Ann Chrisman. And we hired her. And we told her the ball game. Got it to number 27 in the Music Road charts and made his dream come true. And we've been best friends ever since. Yesterday, yesterday was Kathy's, my, my wife's birthday. And I texted him in the morning and I said, well, I've never asked you. No, he, he called me about it. He called me about the song that we're doing on the record. And we were talking about that. And I said, would you do me a favor? I said, I've never asked you any favor in our lifetime. And I said, but it's Kathy's 50th birthday. And she's never met you. And she pretty much knows you through me. Would you mind giving her a call and wishing her a happy birthday? It'll blow her mind. And he said, of course. And about 8 o'clock last night, we had company. Kelly we had a couple of people over for dinner. And uh, Kathy goes, this is Kathy. Yeah, <laughs> he said you might be calling. <laughs> and they were just talked for 20 minutes. I mean, and then Kelly was there. Kelly was uh, was my lawyer, did all my contracts. And Kelly's like, beat red. And Kathy's going, my girlfriend Kelly's standing here and she's beat red. And <laughs> he's got her on, he's got Kevin on the, on the, on the uh, speaker phone. Yeah. And Kevin says, well, then be a good girl. Let me speak to Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> and Kelly goes, and he goes, hey, Kelly, how you doing? And Kelly goes, oh, I'm I'm doing all right, Kevin. <laughs> how are you doing? <laughs> and I'm watching all this go down and just my heart's beating big. It's like, this is great. Thank you for doing that. That's, that's, that's what kind of guy he is. And that's the kind of relationship we have. And we have a song on my record that he's heard. And I, and both times that we've been in the studio, he wanted to be zoomed in. So when Tom Bukovac came to play the other day and play guitar, he was zoomed in. And he, I mean, he told me yesterday, man, I love talking to Tom Bukovac and Adam Box. It's so, guys are so great. He didn't get to talk to people like that very often, you know. And then Jim Moose Brown put keyboards on it two weeks ago. And I zoomed him in for that. And he met Moose and he loved talking to Moose. And so we, that's the kind of relationship we have. And your new project now, you've been working on this for a while? Well, um, <clears throat> yeah. When I signed with Anthem, well, I did this EP, and Anthem thought that my voice and TV would be a good mix. And I, you have to understand that all my life I never sang. I sang with Richie because Richie thought I, I had a real unique voice and I should do it. But once I started writing songs for people in Nashville... I knew better. I knew I had to hire gunslingers to to sing the right songs to get cuts, and my voice was never going to do it. So I didn't. I stopped until about a year, two years ago, and um, and Scott, who owns Dual Tone Records, that has the Lumineers, him, and Kevin, and Jill Goddard, who's over at Anthem, have all. They 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 heard me singing at a, a writer's night and said, "Why don't you be? Why don't you start doing what you do now?" And um, Jill said, "You need to do what you do. We, you get a lot of TV and sync if they hear your voice." And so, I, Adam Box from the Brothers Osborne, he had a studio and he he said, "I'll produce it." And um, so we did, and we got that. And then Anthem signed me, and then Drew Sherrard over there asked me if I'd do a version of Wonderful World, my way. The Louis Armstrong hit, mm -hmm. yeah. So we did, and we just did a really different, really, really eclectic. Have you seen the yeah, video? I saw the video, yeah. That, well, we did it, and then Adam... It's almost very haunting, the way it's it's done. Well, it was, we, we did, had the tracks were all done, and then Adam, it was right before the election, when all hell was breaking loose in America. And Adam said, let's do It's a Wonderful World. And let's show tragedy and beauty and tragedy and beauty. And, and I said, as long as we end with beauty. I said, I want it to end positive. And so we did. And, and we're in the middle of a record now. And I've got people like um, Dwayne Betts from the Owen Betts Band. He just played on it. Drew Smithers from Bishop Gunn, he just played on it. Tim Quicks from Kevin Bacon's band, he's he's about to play on it. Gary Rosington called me yesterday, and him and Ricky Medlock are going to play on two songs. 
um, Moose played on it. Heidi's got a song on there with me, and she's going to sing background and play harp on that song. Heidi Newfield. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so it's going to be a, and it's, it's going to be like that. And when you hear that, it'll be similar to that. But I think the songs are the best songs I've ever written in my life on this album. They're just really, I reached in and got all the truth I could find. You really, you really got your A game going on this one, don't you? I think so. Yeah. I don't know why it waited. But see, that's what Richie said. Richie was an astrolog astrologer to the max, and he did my chart when I was 20. And when he finished doing my chart, he said, I got good news and bad news. He said, you are going to be extremely successful. I said, yeah? He said, yeah, but not till really late in life. And I remembered that, but I didn't, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's really late in life. And things are happening now that should have happened when he, what should happen when I was younger. So yeah. But you persevered and you were persistent, and you made it. Yeah, I mean, I kept. Well, I'm too old to be a hit songwriter right now. I mean, these young guys have got that game written up. So what else can I do to keep my music alive? Well, I want to write for TV and film. That's really what I want to do, and I want to compose. And so I've made friends in that world. He's talking to one today, John Hardy, and I have been. He's another one. I watched a show called Hinterland on Netflix and went, oh, my God, who did the music to that? And I looked it up, and I saw it was John Hardy, and I went, John Hardy. My God, he's done this, he's done this, he's done this. Reached out to him. We've gotten the best of friends. Like my wife would tell you, him and I are, he had never met an American songwriter, and I have never met a classical composer. So the song that we wrote together is on my record. For him to do a piano vocal, he had to do 15 pages of score. That's how he did it. He did the score for him just to do a piano. He couldn't do it like I just said on a guitar and go da 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 da. No, he had to do the whole thing for him to do a piano vocal. And it's just two sides, but we're the best of friends and we do work together and it's great. Wow. Thank you so much for being on the show. This has been a oh. fabulous journey. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been fun. I like talking about this stuff. The Business Side of Music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The Business Side of Music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Fuson.